Welcome to Parenting Decoded, a podcast for practical approaches to parenting. I'm Mary Eschen. In this episode, I interview Elaine Taylor Klaus, co founder of Impact Parents and author of the book, The Essential Guide to Raising Complex Kids with ADHD, Anxiety, and More What Parents and Teachers Really Need to Know to Empower Complicated Kids with Confidence and Calm. I know it's a long title, but it is a fabulous book. Whether or not you have a child who's been diagnosed with ADHD, anxiety, Asperger's, any other executive function issues, or you're just worried that your child is out of step with their peers, please listen in for some great advice on how her book can help you in your journey. Personally, I think we all have complex kids and can learn a lot from Elaine's wisdom. Here you go. Welcome, Elaine Taylor Klaus. I am so happy that you're on my podcast. I am honored that I have such an amazing and talented author and owner of the Impact Parents website, business, and everything that's so helpful to parents. Why don't you take a minute, Elaine, though, and uh, to say hello and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your journey. Thank you. First of all, thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, My name is Elaine Taylor Klaus, and I am the co-founder of Impact Parents. It used to be Impact ADHD back in the early days. Um, It's been impactparents.com for a while. And we provide online training, coaching, and support for parents of what we like to call complex kids, kids who are struggling with some part of life or learning, Um, kids who um, may be failing to hit certain milestones, maybe kids who are just difficult to raise for a variety of reasons, maybe because they've got a diagnosis like ADHD or anxiety or learning disabilities, or maybe just because they're complex kids who are hard to raise, <laughs> you know, lots of reasons. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I do this work because I have three complex kids of my own who are now young adults. And because when I first started as a parent, there was a lot of support out there for my kids and there was nothing available for me. And, and I was struggling and I needed some help. So when I finally discovered coaching and got my head above water, I realized it was something I needed to bring to other parents. So here I am. <laughs> Great. And I read your book and I loved it. I Thank think you. every step of the way, I took so many notes. It's going to be hard for me to like zero in on just a few in, a, in our time together today. But one of the things I wanted to talk about in that the parenting work that I do, I loved how you s- talked about what the four phases of parenting are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Because yeah. I think especially with complex kids, I find it true to be with parents of any kind of ilk of kid, but I think that parents get stuck. I'm in the Bay Area and parents get really stuck. Can you talk about those four phases real quick? And oh, yeah. um, just so that we have sort of a, a setup for what it is that we're trying to work through with those complex kids. Well, so the concept here is that there are kind of four phases of parents. And, and just as a framework, I what I teach, the work that we do is about taking a coach approach to parenting. And coaching is a is an empowerment based methodology, right? It's about helping people reach their potential, and and so as parents, when we learn how to take a coach approach, we're it's about empowering our kids to become more independent, to become more autonomous, to to have a sense of agency in their life. And after we've been doing this work for a while, I've worked with this fabulous woman named Diane Dempster. We've been business partners for for over a decade. And we began to see these patterns and that there were kind of four phases. All parents start off in phase one. That's, you know, that's our job as parents is to, is to direct them to what they need to do to help them find their motivation. It's where we start. It's natural. It's normal. And then, then technically or ideally, as we move through parenting, we want to move through these four stages. So phase two, and I'll go back and explain in a minute, but phase two is, is collaboration. Phase three is support. And then phase four is championing. And that's where we want to get, right? Where we're championing our, our emerging adults. They're living their lives. And we're saying, go, go get them, go at them, come to us when you need help. You want to buy a house, you want to, you know, take a job, whatever. You know, ideally we're setting ourselves up to be their, their wise consult. But it's what happens between phase and phase one and phase four gets a little murky. 
right? For most of us, because yeah. what ha- when you have a complex sure. kid in particular, but I think it's probably true for all kids, we start off in that director mode um, in phase one. And then sometimes we get stuck there because we can see what they need to do. And we need to see why we see why it's important. And so we're so busy telling them what they need to do that we're not collaborating with them and enrolling them in the process of problem solving for themselves. So phase one, we direct, we problem solve, we, we tell them what their motivation is. Ideally, we move into phase two pretty early and we, we do it a lot. It depends on the kid's development and we may be in phase one in some area and phase two in another. But the idea is to begin to collaborate with them so that they're starting to have a sense of agency in their life. So we're not telling them what to do. We're helping them begin to see what they're responsible for doing it and to see it as theirs. So agency is the word I like to use here. So director mode phase one, we're saying you've got homework. Uh, Collaboration mode phase two might be asking questions like, do you have any homework today? Or what do you have for homework today? Right. The shift is it's no longer me directing you. It's now it's yours what's going on with it. And you're still kind of sharing the agenda in phase two. You're still collaborating on what needs to be done. When we move into phase three, and this typically happens with kids a little closer to high school years, but some kids are ready for it in middle school years. Now it's really their agenda. They're owning it. And we move into a support role. So it might be, I know you've got homework to do. And I just wanted you to remember that we also have this event as a family tonight. Is there anything I can do to support you, to help you? So phase three, they're owning it and we're beginning to support them or begin to raise awareness to them to help them see the value of asking for help. If it's not for us, maybe it's from somebody else. So so that's the shift from two to three. Two is a shared agenda. And then phase three, it's their agenda and we are now supporting them in it. Then phase four, which takes a while for them to get to, usually mid to late 20s fully, they're now leading their own life, leading their agenda. And our job is to kind of check in, how you doing, add a a girl, add a boy, add a them, whatever, but really helping them. um, It's support, but it's really more, they're no longer relying on us in in the same way. So those are kind of the four phases in a nutshell. It's direct Mm-hmm. collaborate, support, champion. And we dance between them mm-hmm. as our kids develop. Well, and especially I've found that a lot of parents of uh, complex kids, they wind up having a lot of battles because the kid's like, oh, the kid's not doing it right. Oh, you forgot your homework again. Oh my gosh. And, you know, it's like, there's always something wrong. And I really like how your book lays out a different approach to the problems that come up. You have the one phrase that I love. It says, don't get furious, get curious, mm-hmm. where, where you encourage parents to ask and to keep their own triggers in mind and to ask what's going wrong instead of, you know, what's going on instead of what's going wrong. wrong. And yeah. so talk about that. It's like, you know, and the self-esteem issues that come into lots of complex kids' relationships with themselves and their parents and their peers. Well, I think part of what happens when parents get stuck in phase one, and and it may happen because you've got a complex kid, it may happen because you're a high achiever, and um, I, I call it the achievement elite. You know, when you live when you live in a culture and an environment where everybody's achieving, and and that's the expectation, it puts a lot of pressure on us as parents, and it puts a lot of pressure on our kids, and so. Um, we can get stuck in that director mode because that way we're, we're making sure we're going to get it done and we're going to get it done right. And part of what happens if, if we don't move into that collaboration mode and really help our kids take a sense of agency of their lives, by the time they hit puberty and whatever that is for them, somewhere between you know 11 and 14 or whatever, they're going to start rebelling and individuating and separating because developmentally that's what they're supposed to do. But if we haven't really cultivated a collaborative relationship with them by then, they're just going to say, get out of my business because they're tired of being directed by us. And then we're going to say, okay, fine. You want to do it on your own? Fine. And we throw up our hands. We move to phase four and say, you're on your own, but they're not ready for that yet. And so then they fail. And then we say, see, I told you, you couldn't do it. And then we jump back and justify going back into phase one and directing again. 
when the truth is what they need from us more than anything is to spend most of our time as parents between phases two and three, collaborate and then support, collaborate and support. What they need from us is to feel empowered, to feel capable for themselves, not to undermine them by saying, you can't do it, so I'm going to do it for you, but to say, you, you can do it and you may not know how yet, so let's work together to help you achieve this until you're able to do it on your own, to really set that vision for yeah. them of their cap- capability. I love how you keep coming to that in the book. It's just really a wonderfully connecting uh, approach that you're proposing. One of the things that you um, have is an, you have a number of acronyms that I like. One of them is ACE, acknowledge, mm. use compassion and explore um, to be able to give a parent an idea about like, oh, this thing happened that's really annoying. Like, okay. You know, tell tell about that little approach that you give to people that's in the book. It's so helpful. It's so helpful. It's like one of the best communication strategies. Um, it's called ACE. Oh, and I, I was just working with a client this morning who's in who's a mom of a 17 year old going off to college. Who's kind of like not sure if he's ready to go off to college and she's really not sure if he's ready. And so we were u- talking about <laughs> using this strategy because the truth is he is ready, but he's scared. Right. And so what he needs from her is to acknowledge his experience without stepping in to take it over. And so so A stands for acknowledge plus compassion before you explore your options. And sometimes we spend a lot of time in that acknowledging compassion and knowledge and compassion. And so it might be um, I can really see that you're frustrated with this or I see that you're struggling with this or I know that this is hard for you or. Um, some kind of acknowledgement of what their experience is, because what our kids are experiencing is real. This is their experience. And it's, it's not helpful for them or for us, for us to say, no, don't feel that way because this is what they're going through. So acknowledgement lets them know that we hear them and we see them and we respect them as a human being. And then compassion lets us know that, you know, it's kind of normal to feel how they might be feeling before we move into explore. So the example I was I was talking about today was a mom trying to help her son apply for register for classes. And so it was, I get that this is frustrating for you. It was, this is the conversation we talked about her having. I get that this is really frustrating. You know, for, for kids with ADHD, sometimes getting, we procrastinate, kids with ADD procrastinate because they're overwhelmed or they don't really know what to expect. And so they just avoid it because they don't know what to expect. I know it was like that for me when I was in college or starting college. So there's your compassion. So, and then before exploring, again, we want to give him autonomy. So would you be willing to have a conversation about what the, what the options are? Would you be open to having some help instead of, so you need to let me help you, which is that tendency in the director mode yeah. to shift to, yeah. I can see that you're struggling. It makes perfect sense that you'd be struggling. You've never gone away to college before. You might even need some help in the future when you decide to maybe buy a house. You might have to ask for help then too. I know it's not your favorite thing. I know I'm not big on it either. And I can see it makes sense that you'd be struggling with this. Would you be willing to accept some help? So that asking permission piece mm-hmm. and kind of throwing that into it, but with older kids in particular, Instead of just forcing our advice or support on them, we really want to ask them to engage with us. Yeah, I had a, a client who had a fourth grader with ADD, ADHD, and um, the parents kept doing everything for him because, right. like, oh my gosh, you got to go to you got to go to baseball practice. I'm gonna the dad would pack the bag, right? And I'm like, that's it. Come, it's like uh, you got to let the kid pack the bag in. And one of the things in the book that you go over is how to look at failure differently. Mm. You look, you real, you have a, a part of the book that talks about using failures as opportunities. And you had another acronym for it. I, I have it in my notes somewhere here. Well, but, we call um, it failing is forward. It, is it? Yeah, that's one of the one of the parts that I just love. Uh, yeah, talk a little bit about that. Well, it's the, you know, people don't learn from getting things right. People actually learn from getting things wrong and making mistakes. That's why we have chocolate chip cookies for crying out loud. Like mistakes are not (laughs) the crisis of the world. Mistakes are how people learn. And so if we can create an environment in our homes that that makes it okay to make mistakes, then we can help our kids learn to fail forward from them instead of avoiding them at all costs. And 
you know, I'm an adult with ADD now. I know I didn't know it when I was a kid. And I avoided failure at all costs. And I, I didn't major in what I would have liked to have major in because I wasn't, I was afraid I wasn't going to do well enough. And there were all kinds of things I avoided for fear of failure. Whereas when we create an environment that makes failure normal and part of part of life's experience, then we're teaching our kids to self-regulate, to self-manage, and to learn from their mistakes, which is really huge, huge opportunity for adulting. Because adults who don't take responsibility for their mistakes, we, we've kind of seen where that goes in the last few years, and that's not a pretty picture, right? So it's really, really important sure. to help our kids learn to do this. And the way to do it is by failing forward. And what I call the magic three questions, right? What worked? What didn't work? What do you want to do differently? What do you want to try differently? Because if we can't, if we can't look objectively at something without judging ourselves, then we can't learn from the mistakes and make it better the next time. But that non-judgment is right. kind of important. And I love, yeah. And in your book, you, you so kindly and patiently put forth those ideas. And I just can't say enough how useful it is. All this information is so useful. I love another section of the book that talks about um, not letting your own stuff get mixed up. And, um, you know, knowing what you're learning, your own triggers so that it's like, oh, my God, my kid left their backpack at home again. Um, you know, it's like knowing that this is going to get you and how you regulate yourself. Um, you know, you have a whole chapter, I think, for oh, yeah. being we careful do, we about do a, your, your own positive attitude. We do a ton of work around managing triggers because there, our triggers are ours, right? Yes, our kids know how to push our buttons. But there's still, it, our reactivity is our responsibility as parents. And, and so we can choose whether we want to react or respond. Reacting tends to damage relationships. It tends to cause explosions. It causes all of these complications. And when we can slow down and take our own emotionality out of it, we can respond and meet our kids where they are and meet them with what they need. Um, I was doing some work with a group of parents recently. We, we run a group for members in our community on positive intelligence. And we were talking about this just yesterday, this notion that if we're reacting all the time, what we're kind of saying to our kids is change your behavior and calm me down. And what we really want to be doing is staying, is doing the work we have to do, managing our own nervous system, our own reactivity, whatever it is, and calming ourselves down so that we can be the adult in the conversation. And we can be present to what their needs. And, and being the adult doesn't mean controlling this situation. It means controlling how we respond to whatever happens. And that's a huge shift. Yeah, and, and, and in the book, you talk about those responses and how to shift your own response as a parent to be having a positive tone instead mm -hmm. of all those little subtle, like, you should have done this. Mm -hmm. you, should, you know, you have really nice alternative phrases to give the parents to use. And it's, you know, so empowering. You want, would you mind get, sharing a couple of ideas that you have about how to make your household more parent positive well, that you present in the book? Well, par parenting positively is, it's an important, so the, our framework has kind of four foundational cornerstones and positive parenting is one of them. Um, and, and I would say there's probably not a parenting paradigm in the world that doesn't include positive parenting. It's important and it's not enough, <laughs> right? But it is really, really important for us to manage ourselves, to self-regulate enough, to come from a positive attitude, to help people focus on what they want instead, what the, what we want from them instead of what they're doing wrong. We have this tendency to criticize kids again and again for what they're doing wrong, and that just beats them down. But if you can help them begin to see what you want them to move towards, instead of don't hit your sister, it may be you know, I'd really like to see you be able to sit at the table with your sister and find something playful to do together. Like that's showing them what you want instead of what you don't want. Um, and that's just one of many, many examples of, of positive positivity in parenting. But it all starts with um, managing ourselves. I was thinking as you were asking the question, in my early years of parenting, my first decade of a parent, um, I was a really, really, really anxious mom. And, and I was, and so that was guiding everything. 
I was terrified of my kids failure. I was terrified of their lack of performance. I was terrified of them being different. I was like, I was so busy trying to fit these round pegs, these, these starfish into these little round holes somehow, you know, like (laughs) that, that I was making everybody crazy. And it wasn't until I started getting this coaching support and I started shifting to see what was possible instead of what was broken. I started shifting to see, to look for the positive instead of the negative, to, to look for the, the silver lining or the gift and the opportunity. Right. And, and as I learned, and I, I used to call it spin control, but as I learned to spin anything that happened from, you know, you're not responsible for the first thought. The first thought may be, this is a catastrophe. Something terrible is going to happen. Like, okay, fine. We all have our first thought, but the second thought is up to me and I can continue to go down on that catastrophic path, or I can say, okay, so she failed a math test or he, you know, is struggling with reading. Well, now I know that now I can do something to help him with it. Right. Once, once we see it without judgment, when we take the shame and the blame and the judgment and just let things be what they are, we can interpret how we want to respond to it. And I know this sounds like, um, magical thinking, but all I can tell you is that it, it works unbelievably well to manage our mindset around anything that's happening because our mindset really matters and it changes the course of action we're going to take and it changes outcomes as a result. So yeah. our mindset is is probably the most important thing we can work on as a parent. Yeah. And I love that your, your book goes over that. It gives, mm-hmm. it gives, you know, a really nice, concise way of, and examples of how our mindsets can impact our parenting in positive ways, not right. necessarily if we can move away from the negatives. One of the things that my parents um, and you touch on in the book is how some parents are afraid to get their kids diagnosed to having a complex issue, whatever it is, because there's a lot of shame and they think in, involved in that. And I liked your perspective. Um, maybe you could share it about how you felt as a kid. And then you, upon learning that you had uh, issues yourself as an adult, you're like, Oh, is that why I felt so terrible as a kid? Can you give that perspective um, that you do cover in the book? I I mean, I think parents are are trying to avoid stigma, right? And parents, you know, as a parent, all we want is for our kids to be happy and successful and healthy and whatever that means. Um, And, and I don't think we realize the extent to which by avoiding a label or a diagnosis or an understanding of what's going on with our kids, we actually fuel this, this self-hatred of them. And, and if we don't help kids understand what's going on with them, what they're going to make up is that they're lazy, crazy, or stupid. You know, in my story, when I was in eighth grade, and I remember going to my mom and saying, I think I'm going crazy. And, and I really felt that way at 13 years old. Now, I think probably all 13-year-olds on some level (laughs) feel that way. But in hindsight, I was a a, a smart 13-year-old kid with with undiagnosed learning disabilities and undiagnosed attention issues. And no wonder I felt like I was going a little crazy. And had somebody really taken it seriously, my mom tried and took me to a therapist who said, you're fine, and sent me on my way because they didn't even know back then that girls could have ADHD. Um, (laughs) You know... If, if I had understood it, I could have gotten the support I needed and I could have made some very, very different choices in my life. And I think that's really what it's about is to give our kids a, a way to understand themselves so they can learn to manage themselves. So, you know, going back to this, this mom I was talking to today, was a 17 year old going off to college, which is kind of young to be going off to college, right? Um, with ADHD and learning disabilities. And for him to understand, well, it's hard for me to get started on something because that's the way my ADHD shows up. Or when I get overwhelmed, I tend to avoid things because that's the way my ADD shows up. If he can give himself that narrative and then learn to manage it, he's going to have very different outcomes than if he decides, well, I'm an idiot or I'm stupid or I just don't care. And that's what kids will make up if we don't help them learn to understand themselves without judgment and to navigate whatever it is. Because, you know what, Mary, everybody's got something. 
everybody's dealing with something. There's <laughs> no one that's going to get yeah. through high school unscathed <laughs> without some challenge along the way. It's just um, not going to happen. That is so true. As, as we were setting up for the to talk, we I had mentioned, it's like, I think everybody has a complex kid. There's mm-hmm. nobody that doesn't have a complex kid, whether or not you have a diagnosis for it or not. But I like how in your book, you encourage parents from a different perspective, from the perspective of that kid who thinks they're crazy, lazy, or stupid. Because I do mm-hmm. think that there's a lot of peer pressure from parents to like, oh, my kid isn't walking by, you know, 14 months, or my kid isn't um, doing, you know, algebra by seventh grade or, you know, whatever. There's all this pressure. And then if you have a complex kid who does have, you know, diagnosed or undiagnosed learning disabilities, it's just like, there's all sorts of shame that you talk about. And it's like, if you can start being their advocate in terms of, granted, like your mom, she was trying to be your advocate, but if you can have more information so that you can take a different approach. Um, One of the things that I I didn't know when I was reading the book that you talk about is this idea that the delay learning delay is often 30% a disability of 30% to explain that to to parents. I was, I was amazed and kids who struggle with all of these different issues we're talking about, whether it's anxiety or, or ADHD, it's a little different with learning disability because that's very specific, but, um, but sometimes there as well have, they tend to have about a 30% developmental delay in, in the development of their executive function skills. So, and so when they're younger kids, we often say it's about three to five years. As they get older, obviously the percentages change or the numbers change. But if you're looking at a 12 year old kid who's struggling to manage, you know, has a backpack that's exploding and stuff all over the place and they never get their homework turned in. If you begin to realize that that kid developmentally is only about maybe eight or nine, then that gives you a way to say, oh, well, no wonder they're struggling with their organization. I can support them with that and I can help them learn to manage that. But we want to meet them where they are developmentally, not where we think they should be because they're 12 or 13 or 14. Because, you know, kids develop at different ages and stages and our executive function skills don't actually finish developing until our kids are in their mid to late 20s. With with complex kids, it's it's probably closer to 30 with typical, just perfect neurotypical kids. And I I understand there are some of those out there, although I've never met any, (laughs) but with those kids, their brains aren't fully functioning and developed. Their executive function isn't developed until they're 25 years old. So if you think about the, if you look at it as a, as a developmental spectrum, you just got to figure out where is your kid right now in this area of development and how do we help them move to the next step? instead of some, holding a bar so high that at some point they give up trying because we're just holding it higher than they can achieve, which is what we right. tend to do. And you give some really good suggestions in the book about about setting that bar and where to set it. I like how you guys did that, how you did that, sorry. And um, I also liked how you um, approach the idea of focusing on one problem at a time instead of trying yeah. to fix everything, you know, focus focus on one thing and then move to the next and build on successes. Yes. I think that is such wise advice. And you talk in, 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 <laughs> you know, you have processes in the book that people can, um, can look to. I want to touch on another thing that isn't in the book that you and I were talking about, and you can see it on the website, the website's impact parents, and you have something called sanity school. You want to talk yes. about that a little bit I and love how Sandy it relates school. to the book? Happy to. It definitely, <laughs> it definitely relates to the book. So Sanity School is a behavior training program, behavior therapy training program for parents. And we <laughs> created it the first time in about 2015 because we were coaches and we were doing co- group coaching and private coaching, which we've been doing for about a decade. And we realized that the parents in our community were missing some basic training, the the basic understanding of of executive function of what was going on with their complex kids. And so we decided to put a program in place. We were going to do it initially just for the members in our community. And then it just kind of took off because it became very clear that it's what parents needed in a big way. And so it's our keystone training program. It's called Sanity School for Parents. 
it's six classes in what we call the coach approach. So it's it's the secret to what we do, Mary, is we're actually teaching coaching skills to parents. We don't want parents to become their kid's coach. I want you to be their parent. But if you can learn coaching skills that improve your communication patterns with your kids, it's unbelievable how that can help you empower your kids to become a, more independent. And so it's six classes of of training skills, concepts, exercises, interactive exercises, an amazing workbook, like, and then part being part of a community for three months where you get reinforcement and you get support and you can call in and talk to Diane or me and ask questions. So it's really designed to help parents. Uh, the way I like to say it is get their head around what it means to have your kid, whatever your kid's complexities are, may or may not be. How do you get your head around who is this kid you're raising and how do you what's what does this kid need from you to be the best parent you can be for that kid? Yeah, and great. and then the book is was really written in this last couple of years as a companion guide to support people going through sanity school. I mean, it's just they, they <laughs> definitely go hand in hand. You can read the book independently. And if you really want to if, if you love the book and it's like, OK, now how do I apply this? Sanity school is kind of the next step in the process of applying it. Yeah. And I saw on your website, you have some other um, tip sheets that people can download and stuff like that. I am just so impressed and I want to support you in any way that I can. I think that this is a great, res the, you have great resources and especially for families who have complex kids, but I think anybody could benefit from any of them. And I really appreciate you being on my podcast. I've learned so much reading the book and I hope that the parents will um, will reach out to you and go to sanity school in the long run too. Thanks so much for being here today. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And thanks to all of you for doing what you're doing. You, you make a difference being a conscious parent. Thanks for listening in to this interview. I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. If you need help and encouragement, feel free to contact me at any time. My mission is to help parents feel supported and encouraged, especially with complex kids. Your journey is a challenging one. I have put all of the contact information for Impact Parents on my podcast notes, and I hope you reach out to them. But if you have any questions or need me, send me email, mary at parentingdecoded.com. Lastly, I'd love to have any of you take a minute to rate this podcast and maybe even write a review. It would really, really help encourage me. Take care and be safe. Have a blessed rest of your day.